In the Cairo Gniza, we uncover an ancient rabbinic essay authored in Judeo-Arabic, which offers unique insights into the history and development of the Jewish calendar, specifically regarding the observance of the second day of Yom Tov outside the land of Israel. As we delve deeper, this document emerges as part of a broader debate, addressing the Karaites' opposition to the two-day Yom Tov tradition. By comparing this text with Rambam's perspective, we'll gain a much deeper understanding of this critical issue and a window into a pivotal moment in Jewish history. It's a well-known fact that uh, the Cairo Gniza has led to very impressive uh, uh, materials that um, are relevant for many different areas and many fields, including the field of Limud HaToyra and Limud of Halacha. And in fact, since the discovery of the Cairo Gniza in the 1890s, there have been numerous svarim and documents that have come out that have uh, brought so much light, especially in the era, the era of the Goenim, uh, as well as from the era of the Rishonim, different works that were lost and different pieces of works that were lost, uh, all of which um, has been slowly published over the years, starting in the 1890s. Uh, so this is nothing new. This has been going on for quite a long time. Uh, however, today we're going to look at something that seems to be a piece of Torah, that seems to be a piece of Halacha. Uh, it was not published until the year 2015, and uh, that itself, not in a standard safe or anything like that, but in a academic journal. So we want to take a close look at this uh, particular document, at this particular piece, and what it can teach us about the times uh, and, uh, and anything else. So let's begin here. We're looking at the image. It's housed today at Cambridge University Library in the Taylor Schechter, uh, um, that's what they call their Gniza collection. And here you have a page, and when we look at this page, we can tell that it's written in Aleph base. However, at the same time, we realize that it's not in Hebrew. In other words, we can't read all of these words over here, and that's because it's written in Judeo-Arabic. Many of the documents in the Cairo Gniza are written in Judeo-Arabic. The best way to define Judeo-Arabic is very similar to the way we think about Yiddish. Yiddish is, it's a language that evolved from the German, that Jews made their own, using it and spelling it with Hebrew Aleph base. Well, that's pretty much what Judeo-Arabic is. It's an Arabic language that Jews adopted and took on their own, made it into their own uh, type of uh, language, and spelled it with the Aleph base. So, for example, many of the writings of the Goinim, including from the Rishonim in Spain, like for Rambam example, there's a lot of writing in Judeo-Arabic. So this here is Judeo-Arabic. Now, um, <clears throat> Uh, it, clearly, this particular page that we're looking at, as is going to become, uh, it's going to become clear later on. Uh, this is not the, this is not an autograph. Meaning, this is the author is not the one who's writing uh, this page that's before you. Rather, it's a copyist who's copying a work that was uh, composed by someone else. How we know that? It's going to become a little clear as we move along. Now, people who study the Cairo Gniza, they look around and they see uh, this individual's handwriting and they say, "Hey, that's familiar." Uh, I kind of think that I saw that hand, handwriting uh, before. Uh, and so they go around, they match them up, and indeed it turns out you get matches. And this is quite common. You, you, you can find multiple documents about very different topics written by the same uh, person. Remember, every community has a scribe. The scribe, it's a full-time job. He's writing. You need a writing job, you come to the scribe. So it makes a lot of sense that a lot of his documents would end up in the Cairo uh, Geniza. And uh, from studying this particular handwriting and this scribe, uh, they've determined uh, that we're looking at an individual who learned and lived in the early 1100s. Okay. Um, uh, he, uh, let's take a look at some of the words. Uh, he mentions over here on the bottom left of the word is Galos Yechanya. Um, Galos Yechania is something that he talks about in this document. I'm um, going to do this right now. We're going to just pick up a few phrases along the way, um, and, uh, and then we're going to kind of piece it together. Galos Yechania, the story is briefly at the end of Bayes Rishon, 
uh, about 10 years before the Beis Hamikdash was ultimately destroyed, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar comes, he takes the king, at the time his name was Yehoyachin or Yechanya, he takes him together with all the elites of Yerushalayim, the more powerful and the nobility, and he takes them to Babel and they're exiled. Uh, the Beis HaMikdash lasts for about another 10 years before it is destroyed. This is known as the Golos of Yechania. We read the Megillah of Esther that Mordechai went to Golos Bavel with this particular uh, Golos. So the author over here, uh, the, the, compo- the, the author of this text uh, is talking here about Golos Yechania, and this is going to become significant later on as we move along. Now we turn to the next page. We turn to the next page, and we have over here a few things that I want to point out. On the right-hand side, uh, you should make out the word Soid Ha'ibor. I circled it in red, Soid Ha'ibor. Soid Ha'ibor is a word that is very commonly used by the Rishonim, even by Chazal, to talk about the, uh, the calendar. It's what we say that we have a calendar, and the calendar has specific rules of how it operates with there's the moon aspect, and there's a sun aspect, and there's a Shana Pshuta, and there's a Shana Mo'oberes, and there's 29 days in a month, and 30. All of the rules that go into the calendar, these are all known as Soid Ibor, the secret of the Ibor, because there's a Ibor Chaydesh, you could have a uh, a, a, a pregnant year, a leap year, uh, excuse me, a, a, a leap month, that is a month with an extra day, and you could have a year with an extra month, so that's why it has that word, uh, that's why it has that word, Ibor. Right on top of the word, uh, de Ibor, uh, maybe you can make out the word, Moyadim, which is Yamim Toivim, that's going to be a big part of this document, indeed we're talking about holidays, in fact, it doesn't say Moyadim, it says Allah Moyadim, uh, and that's because in Judeo-Arabic, that's how you would say the word uh, for, uh, for the Moyadim, for the for the holidays. On the type left, you should be able to make out the words in Shama Parim Sfasenu. This is a Pasuk, and we're gonna see, soon see later on. We say this in our davening, that uh, instead of bringing animals for the carbon, we're gonna fill that up. We're gonna take its place uh, with our lips, meaning with our tzilos, with our prayer. A few lines below that, you should see Visamachta Bichagecha, a Pasuk about the Yamim Toivim. All right, so, so far we're seeing over here there's elements of history, Yechanya, there's elements of holiday and calendar over here. Let's continue to the next spread. We go to the next spread here. I'm circling the words, Ki Hayoim Kadosh Ladoineinu. So that actually is a little bit backwards. Uh, the Pasuk in Ezra says, Ki Kadosh Hayoim Ladoineinu, and in our Rosh Hashanah Davening, we say that as well. We quote this, Ki Kadosh Hayoim Ladoineinu. It is very clear from the context of that uh, Pasuk that it is talking about Rosh Hashanah. We'll take a closer visit uh, uh, with this Pasuk later on. The Pasuk continues and says, Va'al te otzvu. Do not uh, be sad. Um, uh, so again, a, a reference here to Rosh Hashanah as we move along in this uh, document. Next page, or the next uh, spread, uh, actually, I'm calling out the words here, Minig avoisechem b'yedechem. Minig avoisechem b'yedechem. Those are Hebrew words. That's no longer in Judeo-Arabic. The minig of your ancestors is something that is still with you. These are words from the Gemara. And as we're going to see, these words are very much relevant to the discussion of Yamtif. Okay, so here's a quote from the Gemara about Yom Tov. Let's move to the next spread. Koirish al-Melech. Koirish al-Melech, that's in Judeo-Arabic, Koirish the king. He's going to become an important person in our story because um, the beginning of the second base Hamikdosh begins with Koirish Melech Paras, who pronounces and says Jews have the right to go back to Eretz Yisrael and to rebuild the base Hamikdosh. So that's the reference over here. Let's go to the next spread. Here I want to call out the top right. You see the words loy adu, loy adu. I hope that's familiar to you. You see the Aleph, Dalet, and the Vav have a pintala on top. And that's because it's telling you it's a Rosh Tavis or it's a Simen. Loy adu is the Simen. It is not brought in the Gemara, but it is brought in the works of the Goenim. And after, loy adu Rosh, that Rosh Hashanah, or more precisely, the first day of Rosh Hashanah, cannot be on an Aleph on a Sunday, on a Dalid, a Wednesday, or a Vav on a Friday. Okay, so we're really getting the feel. This is... A calendar, um, this is an essay about calendar and about Yom Tif and about Jewish history. Uh, those are the things that seem to be coming uh, together here. We turn to the next spread and now we're able to see this is quite a lengthy uh, work. This is not just one little fragment. This goes on for a nice number of pages. And finally, at the top two lines on the right hand side, it ends. It finally ends. It ends with a bracha. Uh, God should give you Sharei Chachmo Bina on the top lines uh, on, the right hand, uh, on the right hand side. Uh, and then, this guy. okay, and then uh, I want to quote, there is a writing right over here that is uh, kind of looks unusual, so let's, uh, 
let's uh, uh, focus on that right now. What does that say? It says as follows. The tshuva finished. So now it says, here is Lirav Haizal, uh, and it goes on to say in Judeo Arabic what's going on here. Translated into Hebrew, it comes out to as follows. Lirav Haizal, Mikoivet, so in other words, the tshuva that is about to appear here, the next tshuva, comes from Rav Hai Goin. Rav Hai Goin is a well-known figure to us who lived in the late 900s, the early 1000s in Pumpadisa. I remember during the American invasion of Iraq, so there was a big siege around Fallujah. So, I don't remember who said this. Well, someone said, oh, Fallujah is Pumpadisa. Fallujah is Pumpadisa. Okay, because Fallujah was in the news every day then. Pumpadisa was one of the big yeshivas in Bavo. You had two big yeshivas, one in Sura and one in Pumpadisa. Okay, so he said that Pumpadisa is Fallujah. So Rav Hai Goin was there in Pumpadisa. And um, he's uh, from the later generation or from the last generations of the Goinim. So the following tshuva that's going to be on the re and the rest over here in the next two pages, not the one that we just skimmed through, uh, that uh, is authored by Rav Haizal. And it comes from the Koivitz Hadar Imanochri Bechotzer. So in other words, the scribe here is telling you that he's copied this out of another booklet. And that booklet is, starts with the words Hadar Imanochri Bechotzer. And specifically within that, it's the 31st uh, tshuva. And he goes on with the exact same handwriting to now go and to bring another tshuva uh, over, uh, over here. So uh, that's how we know, by the way, that uh, this is not an autograph. In other words, this, this is someone who's writing down tshuvas. The first tshuva that he wrote, we don't have the beginning. The first page is the one I showed you. So we don't know who wrote it. And we will not know by the end of this class who wrote this first tshuva. But it was important enough for the scribe, and it made sense to him, to stick it into a booklet that he was writing where he's going to put a tshuva of Rav Haigoyen, and this he's going to put before it. Um, and uh, this tshuva from Rav Haigoyen that we're looking at over here is not, is not new. This is something that is well uh, known. Uh, in the 1860s, a sefer called Tshuvas HaGoinim came out. This is before the discovery of the Cairo Gniza, 1864 in Germany. Uh, tshuva is HaGoinim. And the very first Tshuva that is inside this sefer is this very Tshuva that we're looking at over here from Rav HaGoin. You'll see the words over here in the printed version. Regarding the two days, the second day of Yom Tev that is observed in the Jewish diaspora, and that's the words here, and in fact, it continues to match word for word from this tshuva. So the tshuva of Rav Hai Goin, uh, that, came to us, that, that came down to us it, it, without the Cairo Gniza. A few copies were found in the Gniza too, but this survived in the normal way, if I may say. But the material that's before uh, that, um, that's something that we only have in this particular booklet that was written by this scribe sometime in the 1100s. Uh, in this uh, earlier document, in this earlier tshuva, he mentions Rav Sadia Goin. And he mentions Rav Sadia Goin and he writes the Chorin Lavracha. So we know, obviously, that the author of this tshuva uh, is writing after Rav Sadia Goin passed away. That's the, definitely after that, and definitely before the early 1100s when the scribe, who we know is active during the early 1100s, is writing. So that gives you, you know, 150 uh, or so years of, of a window of when this unknown author would have written this particular tshuva, which again, for our scribe, it made so much sense to place him in a booklet of tshuvas together with uh, Rav Hai Goin. This tshuva of Rav Hai Goin, I mentioned before, was published in the 1860s, in, uh, in the Sefer Tshuvas HaGoinim, but the truth is it was quoted widely by the Rishonim. If you look at the Rush, Meseches Be'a, uh, Perek Aleph, Simon Dalid, he actually quotes over here, Ashayla Sheshaw, Reb Nissen Goin, as Reb Hai Goin Zala. When you read the continuation, it becomes abundantly clear that this is the same Tshuva. And in fact, here we get the, the, a key piece of information of who is the one that Rav Hai Goin was writing to. And the answer is to Rav Nissen Goin. Who's Rav Nissen Goin? Rav Nissen Goin does not live in Bavel. He lives far away in Tunisia, in northern Africa. And he is one of the Gdoyle Yisrael that uh, becomes quite famous uh, uh, in future generations for a number of works that he wrote. Uh, and he, as with was the norm at the time in Spain and in North Africa, would, they would send their questions to Bavel. Bavel was still like the headquarters of Jewry. And Rav Nissen Goin is sending this question to Rav Hai Goin. Uh, and we're going to see uh, later on what exactly this tshuva from Rav Hai was all about. As we're going to see, it's very similar to our anonymous tshuva. Our anonymous tshuva and Rav Hai's tshuva 
Shiva are basically going to be on the same, uh, on the same topic. So that's the general introduction for what uh, we want to do. And obviously now we really are uh, very eager and excited to actually read this guy's uh, chuva. So we're going to read this anonymous chuva and we want to see what he has to say. But in order to do that, first we have to do some background information. So let's get the lights on over here and let us now turn to the handout. And we're going to begin with the very first text. The very first text over here is the Ramba. Because in order for us to frame this piece from the anonymous author, we need to put it up against the Rambam. Rambam is going to be the frame, and then we're going to judge what he has to say against what the Rambam says. So we're turning to Rambam, Hilchas Kiddush HaChodesh Perakei, Halacha Aleph, and we're going to read four halachas from Rambam, all about the calendar and all about the Yomim Toiv. Says the Rambam, for the first four chapters of Hilchas Kiddush HaChodesh, what did I do? I was telling you about how the Jewish calendar works based on observation that you need to see the moon and that's what a month is. And I also told you about what the year is. And, and so I told you, and, and it's also a system of observation, which is the witnesses need to see for the month, they need to see the moon. And for the year, we, we don't necessarily need witnesses, but we take measurements and we see, uh, is Pesach going to be in the right season and all of that. So all of these calculations and cheshboinus that I spoke about in the earlier uh, chapters, Ibor Hashanah Mepnei Hazman Mepnei and the idea of adding an Adar Mepnei Hazman because Pesach is not going to is, Pesach is not going to be after the spring equinox, the Tkufa, which is what it needs to be, around March 20th on Erech. You cannot have Pesach before then. The Rambam earlier I described, if the roads are impassable and no one's going to be able to go up for Aliyah Laredo, so then we're going to have to add a uh, given extra month. So all of that thing, all of this material that we spoke about, it only can be done by the Sanhedrin and Eretz Yisrael. But when the Sanhedrin is not functioning, then we don't do months, and we don't do years in any way of observation or anything else. The only thing we do is the cheshbin that we use today. In other words, the calendar, the Rambam saying, writing sometime in the 1170s or something like that, he's saying, the calendar that we use today. So the din in Torah is that that's what you need to be using if you don't have a Sanhedrin. Where is the source for this? Says the Rambam and Allah Chabez and Dafar Zah, Allah Chalam Moshe Messinaihu. The idea that when you're not using Adim and when you're not using observation, uh, we should follow a calculation, we should follow a calendar, and specifically the calendar that we're using today, this is Halacha Lamoisha Misinai. The Rambam says in his Akdama to Pirisha Mishnai, Halacha Lamoisha Misinai, those instances where things came from Moshe, they're Midoi Raisa, but there is no Psukim, there is no Pasik that you could point to and say, oh, I derived it from this particular Pasik. It's Allah Chalam Aisha Messinai. What's Allah Chalam Aisha Messinai? Shabizman, Shayye Sanhedrin. If there is a Sanhedrin, Koyven al Piyariya. Then we go out to the woods, we look up to the sky, and we take measurements, and we do all that. But bizman she'en sham Sanhedrin, when there is no Sanhedrin, then koivin achesh ben zesh anam achashem bayayoyim, then we go with our calculation that we have today. Okay, now Rambam and Allah Chalam says, when did this transition happen? We all know, once upon a time, we were using witnesses. We were looking for new moons. We were trying to make cheshbonis and checking the, the, the fields to see if we need to add an other or not. When did we transition over to a calendar? Says the Rambam, When did we transition to our calendar? The end of the Talmudic era. What was going on then? Because that's when Israel was destroyed. And there was no more Bez and Kavor. Remember, the only way you could do Kiddush HaChodesh Al Pi is if you have a functioning Sanhedrin. Well, there is no Bezd and Kavua there anymore, and so therefore, you no functioning Sanhedrin. Automatically, then you need to transition over to the calendar. So when did that happen? Besoif Chachmei Atama, the end of the Talmudic era. Avo Bimei Chachmei Mishnah, but earlier, if you go a little earlier, and that is to the era of the Tanoim, the Chaim Bimei Chachmei Talmud, and likewise, in the earlier period of the Talmud, Ad Yimei Abayi including, I assume this means, or up until, right? Up until, including, not including, but till the time of Abaya and Rava. Abaya and Rava are fourth generation Amaroyim. Roughly speaking, it's hard to know exactly, but roughly speaking, we're, we're looking at individuals who lived in the first half, the early 300s. So that's when, that's, uh, so still at that time, that's when they would rely on Eretz Yisrael. So when did the disruption happen? The disruption happened sometime in the middle of the 4th century. That's what we would say. Sometime, that's when we transitioned. No more Sanhedrin. And so we went over to the established calendar that we're still using. 
Says, continues the Rambam, one more halacha before we go over to the tshuva from the Cairo Gniza. Sanhedrin kayemes. In the days when we did have the Sanhedrin, and then we make our moons and we set up our calendar based on observation. So how you bnei Eretz Yisrael, the Jews in Israel, and likewise all places where the shluchim of Tishrei are able to get to I'll explain what that means in a second. Then Oisid Yomtiv Yom Yom Toivim Yom Echad Bovad. The Yomtiv is made one day. Sukkot is observed one day. Pesach is observed one day. Uh, Shavuos is observed one day. This is true in Eretz Yisrael. It's also true outside Eretz Yisrael, specifically for the places where the Shluchei Tishrei can go. What does it mean, Shluchei Tishrei? In Tishrei, Tishrei, uh, both Pesach and uh, and Sukkot are begin on the fifth, on the fourteenth at night, the fifteenth day of the month. However, you have more days for travel in Nisan than you do in. Uh, in, uh, than you do in Tishrei, because Tishrei, the first day of the month, you can't travel, it's Rosh Hashanah. The 10th day of the month, you can't travel because it's, uh, because it's Yom Kippur. Obviously, Shabbos is the same for both. So the idea here is that there's, in Nisan, you would have 14 days to get there. In Tishrei, you would have 12 days to get there. And the Chachamim didn't want that one place, they, 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 you can imagine this wouldn't be a good idea, where Tishrei... Uh, because the Shluchim couldn't get to you, so you observe two days, and uh, Nisan, where they could get to you, you observe one day, that's messy. So they made a very firm line. They said, if the Tishrei Shluchim get to you within 12 days, then fine, you could do everything one day. If the Tishrei Shluchim cannot get to you, then even if the Nisan ones could get to you, you're doing two days. And that's what the Rambam says over here. Anyone in Eretz Yisrael or outside Eretz Yisrael, if you're within 12 days, so the Shluchim and Tishrei could get to you, then you only made one Yom Echad Bovad. Why? Because they came to you before Yom Tif. They said, by the way, Rosh Chedesh was on this and this day, which means you want to know which day is Tezvav, we can say with certainty this is Tezvav, so there's no Sveik of the Yoima, and so you could observe, uh, you could observe Yom Tev. However, anywhere else that is further, and it's past 12 days, and so the Shluchim of Tishrei can get there, they observe two days. Why are they observing two days? Because of a doubt. They don't know when Rish Chodesh is. They have no clue. Was Rish Chodesh Monday or Tuesday? It's, all, it's only a question of one day. Was Rish Chodesh declared on Monday? Or was it declared on Tuesday? They don't know. But by the time they find out, it's into Yom Tif already. So they had no choice. They have to observe Yom Tif, Sukkot, Pesach, Shuas. They're observing two days uh, to correspond for the two possibilities of when Rish Chodesh could have been. Because they did not know when uh, the Bnei Eretz Yisrael made Rish Chodesh. This is what the Rambam Upset. This is a basic primer, uh, probably material we're all familiar with already, but it's good to remind ourselves of with these core principles of how the Rambam describes what are, uh, how, are, how the history of the calendar and how it worked. Uh, and now, with this information, let's go into this uh, tshuva from the Cairo Gniza, the anonymous tshuva. Let's read what he has to say. And what we're going to notice is that he says things that are different. He has a little bit of a different narrative. Um, in fact, uh, we're going to break this up into two pieces. We're going to do, we stopped here after Allah Hadalid. We'll do half of the tshuva now. Then we'll go back to the Rambam, do a little more material, and then see, uh, and see uh, again how the tshuva and the Cairo Gniza takes it differently. So it was written in Judeo-Arabic, but it was translated by uh, Mordechai. Akiva Friedman uh, about uh, 10 years ago or so and um, and let's so I'm reading from his Hebrew translation so it says as follows uh, I'm actually going to look at the text but I'm going to just paraphrase it in English so when the Jewish people were uh, went into exile in the first exile they went to distant lands and uh, amongst uh, them were the Jews who went with the Galus Yechanya. Those are the words I showed you before. And that is when the king Yechanya, together with all the elite, were taken, to, uh, were taken to Bavel. And when you have these Jewish communities that are far away from Eretz Yisrael in Bavel, so then they're in pain. Mitztarim v'doyavim. Why are they in pain? That they don't have the ability to do aliyah l'regel. They do not have the ability to do the mitzvah of going to be present in the base hamikdash for the yamim toivim. They don't have the ability to make karbanis, and they don't have the ability to do the other mitzvahs associated with the yamim toivim. And so, therefore, uh, with uh, unanimously, they agreed that they are going to observe the yamim toivim that Hashem commanded. They're going to do this al soid ha'ibur. I told you before, the soid ha'ibur, soid ha'ibur is they're going to follow the calendar. They're going to follow the calendar. We're does this calendar come from? The calendar that comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. We got this from Moshe Rabbeinu. That is 
Exactly what the Rambam said. You remember the Rambam said that when you're not doing Sanhedrin pi al pi ar-i'il, you're following the Cheshvain. He said that's halach la Moshe Sinai. That goes back to Moshe at Sinai. Well, here we see this anonymous author, he says the same thing. That uh, this calendar, Soida Yibor, uh, goes back all the way to Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, so they agreed that, but that's not what they agreed, that they're going to follow that. That comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. They agree that they're going to take the Yom Tif that generally follows the calendar and they're going to do a Chiddush. What's the Chiddush that they're going to do? Yoimayim. That they're going to observe it two days. And that doesn't come from Moshe. The idea that you need to keep two days Yom Tif, that doesn't come from Moshe Rabbeinu. In fact, the Rambam didn't say that the second day comes from Moshe Rabbeinu. The Rambam told us, why do we have a second day? Because of sake of the Yom Because we were, we're not sure. We're not sure which day was Yom Tif originally. That's what it was. And so therefore, uh, we observed an extra day. Well, here we're going to see a little bit of a different narrative. The Yidin, in the time of the first Chorbin, they decided that they're going to observe the calendar, but also they are going to add an extra day. The Rishon is Choyva Min Atoyra obligatory, and the second one that they agree that they're the second day of Yom Tif, why are they doing this? Bitzmura, this is to take the place of the fact that they're missing Aliyah Leregel. And they're missing the Karbanis that they don't have the ability to do. Number two. And that's the Pasuk Unasham of Farim Sosenu, that something that you're not able to do with a carbon, you could make up with your lips. Well here, we're not going to make it up with our lips per se, but we'll make it up with a new day of Yom Tif, Which may have extra prayers, so then it is lips. Okay, uh, in addition, we want to do it uh, to take the place of the Simcha Agdailah that Yidin experienced when they went to the Beis HaMikdash uh, per the verse V'samach Tabechagecha. So, so far, three things. We are creating a second day of Yom Tif to take the place of a, a, a Liel Regal, a Karbin, and a Simcha. But more, it's, taking, it's doing more. We're also using this as a day, an extra day, a day dedicated to be, to ask for kirvas hakel, closeness to God, and to lishkoid al chasadov, and that is to thank him for all of his kindness, and to ask him to uh, keep his promise, to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael. So that's another three things. A day dedicated to certain closeness with Hashem, thanking Hashem, asking Him to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael, and then he signs off this paragraph by saying, and also to remember the great Simcha, that it shouldn't be forgotten. The great glorious Simcha, uh, he brings here the Pasuk, in Yerushalayim. We're not allowed to forget Yerushalayim. And so we created this second day as a way, as a day to remember the great Simcha that we used to have in Yerushalayim, and this is why the people, in the time of Chorban Ba'is Rish and Galus Yechonia, they all got together and they said, not one day Pesach, two Two days Pesach, not one day Shavuos, two days Shavuos. Why? This is the reason, uh, and as you can tell, this it goes in a very, very different direction uh, than uh, the Rambam. Because for the Rambam, it's about Sveika the Yoima. Uh, that's why we have the second day. And for here, you see no element of Suffolk whatsoever. Uh, it's a very different uh, theme of why the second day uh, is uh, why the second day is uh, added. Okay, uh, let's continue. He then goes on to say, this uh, uh, quest that they had to be close to God through adding the second day, uh, and by accepting upon themselves the extra day of Yom Tif, they actually have biblical precedent. See, he's looking, it's interesting, he, the author here thinks it's important to have biblical precedent for this. Why? What is the biblical precedent? So he brings two stories. Two stories in Nach, where Yidin observed a Yom Tif that you're supposed to observe in the Torah. And in these two unique occasions, he didn't actually add days to the uh, Simcha. Where are the two places? First place, first up, he brings from Shloim HaMalach. Shloim HaMalach, when they did the Chanukah Sabayis Harishain, it was right around the period of Sukkot. They had seven days of Sukkot, they had seven days of Chanukah Sabayis first, which means that it covered the day where Yom Kippur would be. Seven days Chanukah Sabayis, seven days of Sukkot. Here you see they added days to the Yom Tif. In fact, they added seven days. They didn't do it after, they did it before. And that was great. It worked for Shleim HaMelech. So the, it's, it's a good idea to add days to a Yom Tif. Shleim HaMelech did it. Uh, it's good for the people in Yechania to do it too. The second story uh, he brings is the Maisa with Yechizkiyo HaMelech. So there's a famous celebration of Pesach that Yechizkiyo HaMelech presided over. The Beis HaMikdosh was impure and he purified it. Uh, they delayed Pesach a month. There's a whole Maisa. But once the Pesach does happen over there, the Pasuk reports that they celebrated Pesach for seven days, and then they did another seven days just celebrating the occasion that they retook the Pesach Mikdash and everything is good, uh, and that they're turning closer to Hashem. And the Pesukim there go on and speak about the fact that Hashem liked this, specifically in the case of 
the Pesach of Chizkiyo, because it, you have over there a Pasuk and Divra Ayamim, that at the end of the celebration it says that the Kayanim blessed the people and God listened to this blessing and their prayer was accepted into God's abode in Shemayim. So you see clearly over here that um, it's a good idea to, uh, to add days uh, to, uh, to a Yom Tov. Uh, okay, so, uh, um, so just to summarize, Similar to the Rambam, what do we have? Halach Moshe Messinai. The idea that the calendar, the system of the calendar goes back to Moshe Messinai, we had that in the Rambam, we had it over here. Um, Rambam didn't speak at all about this early period. In fact, the earliest, the Rambam, when he gives his overview, his earliest phase is Chachmei Mishnah. That's his earliest phase. That's where he starts the clock. He starts the clock at Chachmei Mishnah, and he says, Chachmei Mishnah, we're doing it al pi haria, and then we transition to a calendar. So if you ask Rambam, Phase one of application of a Jewish calendar is when? He would tell you, after the days of Abaya and Rava, in the fourth century, the common era, right? If you ask this anonymous author, phase one of implementation of the Jewish calendar, he's saying it's 600 years earlier, during the time of Gaul's Yechani. That's another significant difference. And in terms of Yom Tov Sheini, for, Yom, for Rambam, what's Yom Tov Sheini? For Rambam, Yom Tov Sheini is, well, originally you had these places, they were too far away from the Shluchim, they had to observe two days of Yom Tov. That's how Yom Tov Sheini began. If you ask this author, how does Yom Tov Sheini begin? Yom Tov Sheini begins when people say, it's a good idea to add another day, as a Tmura, to take the place, as a Zecher, and all of the words that he, uh, that he brought. Uh, before we continue, I think it's uh, important to notice over here that um, there seems to be echoes of some sort of battle that's going on over here. Uh, especially when he turns to Psukim and he's starting to invoke Psukim. And, 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 uh, and there's another point of where you see this. Uh, especially by trying to go back in time and, and be Kivea that the concept of the two days is much older than you think it is, uh, that's the type of thing that you expect to come out when there's some sort of battle and when there is some sort of disagreement. So, oh, it's much older than you think it is. In fact, it goes back all the way to uh, the beginning of uh, Golos uh, Bavel. Uh, and, oh, and I have Psukim that show you it's a good idea to add days uh, to a Yom Tov. So I want to talk about that uh, before we continue uh, comparing uh, uh, the rest of the Tshuva with uh, the Rambam. We do know from other sources, in fact, from the very tshuva that I showed you before from Rav Hai Goin, I'm going to focus on that in a moment, we know from these sources that there was a major debate during the 10 hundreds and uh, that tukufa in general about the calendar in general and specifically about Yom Tov Sheni uh, Shel Goliath, about the observation of the second day of Yom Tov. There were observing the second day of Yom Tov. There was a schism in Jewish history. Uh, wanna, I don't want to go too far into this. Uh, but it's known as the Karoim or the Karaites, uh, Jews who say that they reject Torah Shabbat. And obviously, uh, part of their rejection was uh, Yom Tov is observed one day by them. There were times, and during these, this period, the High Middle Ages, uh, if you walked into a Jewish community like Fostat, you would have half Jews, half Karaites. Uh, it wasn't like today, where there's very few uh, Karaites uh, remaining, at least relatively speaking. This was once a very flourishing, uh, very flourishing movement. And uh, there are works. You see Chachamim, like Ibn Ezra, for example, in his commentaries. Sometimes he's like, no, they're wrong. And he writes about why they're wrong. Or you see even the Rambam Mishnah Torah, in a few places, you'll notice he puts on a polemical hat. And if you read really well, you see that he's actually addressing a Karite uh, issue. And, um, and, uh, and, 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 and likewise on the other side, in their writings as well, uh, they're, they're, dealing, uh, they're dealing with us and what we, uh, and what we have to say. Uh, so let's read from this tshuva to Rabbi Goin that I showed you before that was in this very same booklet. In the same Gneza booklet, right after our anonymous tshuva, we have this Rav Hai tshuva, and you're going to see evidence for this type of uh, debate. We already know that it was Rav Nisim Goin who wrote a question to Rav Nisim Goin in Tunisia, writing to Rav Hai Goin in, what's today, Iraq. And, um, and here's a, let's read the quote of the question closer. So he says as follows. Rev, Rev Nissen writes, Kal elu yom Anytime we have this conversation of that we observe a second day of Yom Tov because of some sort of doubt. We get harassed a lot by the minin, by the heretics. We get harassed a lot by this whole topic of Sveika de Yoima being a reason for observance of a second day of Yom Tov. And I want you, Rev Nissen Goin writes to Rav Hai, to take away and to remove their complaint against them. Give us good material to defend ourselves, just like you did with your famous tshuva about the tkiyas. 
The famous tshuva about the tkiyas is actually worthy of a class for itself, but in a nutshell, there were Karaites who went to the uh, uh, rabbinite, to a regular uh, yid who observes halacha, and says, what's the premise of your uh, everything, your Yiddishkeit? Tradition. Tradition, oral tradition. Ah, your tradition you have intact? Yeah, yeah, we have it intact. We're good. From generation to generation, we're intact. Ah, let me ask you a question. On, on uh, Rosh Hashanah, when you blow the shofar, what's the sound of a trua? The guy says, oh, actually, the sound of a trua, there's two traditions. There's one shita is that it's a shvarim, and the other is that it's a trua, so we do both. Ah, so you don't know, uh, what, a, you don't know what a trua is. Are you sure you have a good tradition? This is literally conversations that were happening. And Rav Haigoyen wrote a famous tshuva, and he writes, he knows that this is what they're saying, and he writes a tshuva, and he says, no, it's not that we forgot, we didn't know what happened. He said, lechatchila, there were two paths. There were two ways, and they were both valid. And you could do it through this way, you could do it through that way. This is a, right? On the Shabbos meal, you could eat this type of chalent, that type of chalent. It's not a, both of them are valid. It's, a, it's just because you have, di- diversity isn't necessarily a, a, a symbol that there was amnesia. It could be, but it is not necessarily the case. Okay, so uh, what's shot with the, re- the reason we do both is Rabbi Vo came along and said, it's not a good idea that some Jews are doing like this, some are doing like that. It looks to the lay people like some sort of machlaikas, and so therefore we need to be ma'ache dominic. This is the famous tshuva of Rabbi Goin. So Rabbi Nissen Goin is like, great, you get 10 points for the shoifer thing, you solved the problem for there, but now they're harassing us about Yom Tavshani, you need to help us out, you need to, you need to write a tshuva, which is uh, what he does eventually. Rav Nissen Goin continues in his tshuva and says, by the way, there's another whole confusing factor here. And this other additional confusing factor is the writing of Rav Sadia Goin on this topic. Rav Sadia Goin lived in the 900s, the early 900s. And he was a Goin, one of the Goinim in Bavel as well. And he wrote a lot and he spent a lot of energy dealing with the Karaites, by the way. And he says something very shocking when it comes to the whole discussion of the calendar, that the Rambam in Pirish Mishnah, he says that what, he doesn't mention him by name, but he says someone says something and he laughs it out of the room as being ridiculous because it goes against the Shas, it goes against the Gemara. Rav Sadia Goin says that from day one, the calendar was always the calendar that we have today. And that was what Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Harsinai with that particular uh, calendar. And that also said, okay, so you say, well, that's not a Chiddush. No, because the Rambam and our anonymous guy also said that. Yeah, no, 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 no. He says that and only that. That and only that. No moons, no observation, no witnesses, garnish, none of that. And furthermore, he goes on and says, next Chiddush, two days Yom Tif, one day Yom Tif, that came then. Moshe Rabbeinu came down and said, this is how we're going to do it. If you're an Eretz Yisrael, one day. If you're outside Eretz Yisrael, two days, right? So far, we didn't see anyone who says that. So far, it's all either about Tzveika the Yoima, or if it's, or it's about a remembrance of Tzmura, a Zecher, a Zikarin, which either way you slice it, it's, a, it, it, it's not Moshe Rabbeinu coming down and saying, L'chachila, this is what has to happen. So this is what Rav Sadia Goin said. So Rav Nissen Goin writes, this is very confusing for us. Is that really the case? We have Mishnayis that talk about bringing witnesses in, and you're doing cross-examination. Did you see the moon and all that? So what's this? So you know what Rav Sadia Goin says about that? Rav Sadia Goin says that, oh, you're misunderstanding. What happened was that during Bayez Shani, there were people who came and said, your calendar is a very nice calendar, but it happens not to match up with the lunar cycle, so it doesn't make sense. So Chama said, by the way, I'll show you it does match up with the lunar cycle. Come, bring your testimony. All right, you guys, you happy now with the testimony? It worked out? Okay, good. But really, they all along knew that it has nothing to do with the moon and the witnesses or anything. It's radical stuff. And as I said before, the Rambam, Pirshim, Shnais, and Rosh Hashanah, can't handle it. He, can't, he literally cannot handle it. So Reb, Reb Nissen going, once he's writing to Reb Hai going about all the problems that they're having, dealing with Karaites about the second day of Yom Tif, throws this in there and says, and can you help us out with this? Because this is, he's obviously it's before the Rambam, right? The Rambam's later. So Reb Nissen going is writing to Reb Hai going, help us out with this very, very difficult controversial passage of, by uh, Reb uh, Sadia going. Uh, so uh, here we're going to quote one line from the answer of Rabbi Haigoyen, only one line from the answer of Rabbi Haigoyen, and that is, he says, Kizesha Amartem, the last paragraph in three, Kizesha Amartem, Shakasav Rabbeinu Sadia Goin Piyumi, he sometimes calls Reb Sadia Al Piyumi, I don't know why, I don't know what Piyumi is. Uh, this that you say about Reb Sadia, don't take it seriously. He's just using it as a stick 
to knock the apikoidus. In other words, sometimes we give fake answers when we just need to knock the heretic off his feet and get him out of the room. Don't take it seriously. This is what Rav Hai Goin says about the great Rav Sadia Goin's uh, interpretation about the calendar. What do you see from this whole discussion here? There was a Karite issue. So now come back to this tshuva in the Cairo Gniza. And what is this person doing? He's saying, by the way, Yom Tushen Ishogali is much older than you think. It goes back to Golos Yechanya. And by the way, I have Psukim. Not a bad idea to add days to Yom Tif. That is material that when you're having a debate with a Karite, that's something that works. That's something you have Psukim. They like Psukim, right? You have Psukim that say, it's okay to add seven days to holiday, so why not add one? And you're saying that this institution is not a recent institution. This institution goes uh, way back to the time of, uh, to the time of, uh, of Galus uh, Yechanya. Okay, now there's more here. There's more differences between the tshuva of the Rambam, excuse me, the, the perak of the Rambam, as well as uh, compared, matched up against this anonymous tshuva. In order to see the rest of the differences, let's go back to the Rambam and continue reading. Hilchas Kiddush HaChodesh Perak Zok the Rambam, Bizman Hazesh, Ein Sham Sanhedrin, today when we do not have Sanhedrin, and the Bezin in Eretz Yisrael doesn't do al Ri'iyah, rather they follow the calendar. So then, theoretically, the halacha should have been that every place should do one day of Yom Tif. What was the whole reason for two days in the Rambam's model? The only reason for two, day, two days was that you have Kiddush HaChodesh al Ri'iyah, and now you have places that are distant. Take those two facts together, Kiddush HaChodesh al Ri'iyah, people that are distant, we have no choice but to observe two days. Now we knocked it out. Now we're just following the Cheshman. You're following the Cheshman all over the world, follow the Cheshman and do one day. You know exactly which day is Tesvav Nisan. Aval takon as chachamim udis a takon of chachamim she yiz haru b'mining aveseim shabiyadim that we need to be careful about the tradition that we have. In other words, if you go back far back enough of people, let's say we're living in uh, let's say we're living in uh, in uh, Turkey. So if you go back far enough, a community living in in Turkey, they would say their fathers, 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 all the way back up, they. Taka kept two days of Yom Tif because they were waiting for the Shulchim to come and they lived too far. When Kiddush HaKadosh HaPiriya, Taka, Taka Nesachom Emoz, is, so then you have to follow that. If you're living in that place, then you need to follow it. Why? The Rambam does not give a reason. He just says, Taka Nesachom. Let's go to the Gemara in Be'ah, which is the Mokr. Gemara Be'ah, Davdal, and Amir Be'ez. Frek the Gemara, V'hash, Diyad Inom, Bikfiya, Diyarcha. Now that we know the kvius of the moon. In other words, now that we have a fixed calendar that we know when each day is. My time of din on tre yoimi. What is the reason for two days of Yom Tif? And for the Gemara, Mishum Tushoch, Humitam, they sent from there. It's interesting. The answer didn't come locally in Chutz Laaretz. The answer came from Eretz Yisrael. That's very interesting because you have Doile Atoira Outside Eretz Yisrael, but no, the answer came from Eretz Yisrael. What was the answer? Keep, this is very close to the Lashon, almost exact, the Lashon that the Rambam has, keep the minig that you have in your hands. And so therefore, uh, uh, keep two days of Yom Tif. The Gemara goes on to continue uh, to say, and this the Rambam did not bring, Zimin de Gozru HaMalchus Gzeira, V'asi Le'il Le'iklukuli. That what's going to happen? We're afraid the government is going to make a gzera. You're not allowed to learn Torah. You're not allowed to learn Torah. You're not going to learn the rules of the calendar. You're not going to learn the rules of the calendar. You're not going to know how to set up the Yom Tif. You're not going to know which day uh, to set up the Yom Tif. Because the assumption here is following the calendar is not that Eretz Yisrael mails them out in the beginning of the year and then you have a paper that you're following. That's not the, the assumption. Is no one's writing anything really. What is? But rabbis in each community, you know the system. You know the system. There's rules, so you know the rules, and then you can just know locally. That's if you have rabbis who know the system and know the rules. What if they make a gzera that you can't learn Torah, so then you're going to mess it all up. So therefore, we want you to continue doing a second day. This is the add-on that we have over here in the Gemara about why hizaru b'minig avesechem b'yedechem, which is fascinating that the Rambam didn't bring this. And it's not like Rambam doesn't bring reasons when it comes to why we do not blow the shofar on Shabbos. Rambam gives you the reason. He tells you, we're afraid. Maybe you're going to end up carrying the shofar on Shabbos. So Rambam knows how to give you reasons for Xeris uh, the Rabbanon, for whatever reason over here. This needs more research. He just left it as, this is Takanas Chachamim, and he doesn't deal with it anymore. We have this in the Yerushalmi as well. And here we have a name. The reason I'm showing this to you is because of the name. Rabbi Yossi, it says, it sounds like it's an Amoira who lived in Eretz Yisrael, 
And he's the author of this letter, Mishlach Ksiv Lahain. He sent a letter to Chutz Laaretz. Although we wrote down the system of the calendar, do not change the minig of your ancestors who've since passed away. Even though you have a calendar, keep it up. Who's the one who's writing the letter according to the Roshami? It's Rabbi Yoisi. Okay, so this actually kind of fits Rambam's timeline. What do I mean it fits Rambam's timeline? Because the Rambam told us that till Soif Chachmei Talmud, we were doing what? We were doing Kiddush HaChaydish al When did the Hava Amina come up that, oh, we don't need two days Yom Tov anymore because we're all following a calendar? That only happened but Soif Chachmei Talmud. So when would they have written a letter? Hey, can we go back to one day? And when would the answer, when would that answer be issued? Soif Chachmei Talmud. According to the Rambam, that's when this correspondence would happen. Well, that works very nicely with the Yerushalmi, where it's Rabbi Yosi. Rabbi Yosi presumably is an Amoira. His name is mentioned very often in the Talmud Yerushalmi as an Amoira. So that makes a lot of sense. You put him in that same generation. He's the one who wrote the letter from Eretz Yisrael telling them, uh, that uh, they uh, telling them that they need to keep Yom Tif for uh, they need to continue the minig of keeping Yom Tif, even though the reason uh, doesn't see, uh, doesn't seem to apply anymore. Okay, we're soon going to see what our author of the anonymous tshuva has to say about this. But let's continue and now move to what Rambam says about Rosh Hashanah, and then we'll go back to the tshuva. Says the Rambam about Rosh Hashanah. Yom Tif of Rosh Hashanah, even in the day when they used to do it by observation. Most people in Eretz Yisrael would observe it two days due to a doubt. Why? People don't know. People don't know if you have Lamed Elul comes along and you're up in Tzvas, you're like, is today Rosh Hashanah? Did they declare today Aleph Tishrei and it's Rosh Hashanah or not? You have no way of knowing. There's no time for you to find out that message. It's Yom Tiv today. So you have to observe that day as Rosh Hashanah and then you have to observe the next day as Rosh Hashanah as well. You're not going to know. And so therefore, most people in Eretz Yisrael end up, ended up observing Rosh Hashanah for two days. Then the Rambam goes on and says, in fact, even in Yerushalayim itself, which is the place of Bezdin, many times, even in Bezdin, they would observe two days. Why? What would this mean? Why in Bezdin would they be observing for two days? Because if no one came on Lamed, so they're waiting. They're like, well, maybe someone's going to come soon. So they observing, they're observing that day as a potential Rosh Hashanah in case witnesses come. But then when no one comes, then they end up observing tomorrow. So sometimes, if the, wit if the witnesses came, ended up coming that day, then that day was Rosh Hashanah and the story. And anyone who lived in the area of the best, they knew, okay, today is Rosh Hashanah. Maybe they found out at 11 a.m., 12, 1, 2, 3. They found it as Rosh Hashanah, and then it's over. But if Taka and no Adam came, and they were observing that day as Rosh Hashanah, because maybe Adam are going to come today, and then no Adam came. So then the next day, they're observing Rosh Hashanah a second time. So what is Rambam doing over here? He's trying to basically establish that even in the good days of Kiddush HaKadosh al Rosh Hashanah was observed in all of Eretz Yisrael, pretty much always two days, and even very close to the best, and often. He doesn't tell us how often, but he says it happened often. And why is this information important? Because that is the reason why, because it happened. That two days was a common occurrence in Eretz Yisrael, even in the days of Re'iyah. So therefore, Iskinu, there was a takana, it doesn't tell us who, but there was a takana that even Bnei Yaretz Yisrael need to always observe two days of Rosh Hashanah, even according to our calendar, which is the normal practice today. By the way, this thing, this does not say this clearly in the Gemara. It doesn't say this anywhere clearly in the Gemara, but this is what the Rambam is saying, that this is something that they need to do. Okay, so now that we saw the second part of the Rambam, where we saw him talk about... Um, how Yom Tov Sheni Shel Goliath, both regular Yom Tov Tovim, as well as... Uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. Let us have a look at the continuation of this tshuva from the Cairo Gnizah. He continues and he says, remember so far all he said was that there was a Golos of Yechania, that's when they decided they're keeping second day and it's a great idea to keep second day because you have biblical precedent for adding on to Yom Mim Toivim. That's all he said right now. Now he continues with his narrative. And when God decreed that he's going to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash, and the Abishter inspired Kodesh, Melech Paras, the Kodesh, remember we invoked his name before, who announced that Jews could go up to Eretz Yisrael, and indeed from Babel, thousands of Jews went up, and they came to Yerushalayim. They made the Yom Tif one day. They made the Yom Tif one day. 
How does he know that they made the Yom Tov one day? He says, he brings the Pasuk, Ki Kadosh Hayoyim La'adoyneinu Va'al Te'etzavu. This is the Ma'at, I said before, it's in Ezra, it's in Sefer, Nechemya Perek Ches. So there's a whole mice over there. They didn't gather it, and it says clearly that it was on the first day of the seventh month. And they all gathered, and they all got inspired, and they all started crying that they wanted to do tshuva, which is why the Navi said, don't cry. And that this is a sanctified day. And that's it. It says Hayoim. It doesn't say about the next day. So it sounds like Rosh Hashanah is observed then as a one-day Yom Tov. So now that Rosh Hashanah is observed in Eretz Yisrael, in the beginning of Bayashani is a one-day Yom Tov, so then the people who remain back in Bavel, so they asked the Sanhedrin and the Koyanim and the Chachamim, they asked Eretz Yisrael, what do we do? Can we flip back to one day? Should we follow you guys and do one day? Or we should continue sticking with two days? And here was the answer, Minig avoyseichem biyadeichem. So he's quoting that Gemara. But look how he touches it. You are in the same boat as your parents. You're keeping up what your parents were do, doing. In what way? Because you're not doing Aliyah, Teret Yisrael. So the same reason why they started a second day. Why did they start a second day? Because they're not there in Eretz Yisrael. Are you in Eretz Yisrael? No. Minig same. the same exact thing that your father is doing. That's also what you're doing. And so therefore, there's no Eloyes Chadish Etzelchem Klum Sheyigrin Lashin Aminim. Is there any new information that would cause a change over here? And therefore, you should keep to this Minig. So, a conversation that Rambam, I think kind of, which is more intuitive, following the especially the Rishami, Rambam places this conversation where? He places this conversation in Soif Chachmei Talmud. That's when we went over to the calendar. That's when the question came up. That's when they issued the answer from Eretz Yisrael sometime in the 4th century. Keep up. Keep a second day of uh, Yom Tif. And what do they say? Minig Aviseichem B'yadeichem. How do we touch it? How do we touch it? Keep the tradition of your ancestors of doing two days. That's how we touch the words minig aveseichem yedechem. Tizaharu b'minig aveseichem yedechem. Be careful. Keep your minig. What's he saying? He's saying, no, no, no. Let's back that up. Let's back that up. This happened when in the days of Kodesh. In around the year 350 before BCE, before the Common Era. And they went back to Eretz Yisrael. You didn't went back to Eretz Yisrael. Those remain behind. They're the ones who asked the question. And it's the days of Ezra and Nehemia who are sending the answer back. And what do they say? They're not saying keep the tradition of your ancestors. It's not the thrust of Minigav. They're saying you're in the same boat as your ancestor. The same reason that compelled them to do it is still relevant for you. And so therefore this is what you should be doing. So compared to Rambam, it's a new interpretation. It's also a new time. It's a new interpretation. It's also a new time. And then he goes, and this is the concluding paragraph that we're going to read from this uh, tshuva. He goes on to say, so you see from here, that if you're living in Goyla, in Chutz Laaretz, every Yom Tov is two days. And that's the way it's been. Meiratius ha Goyla, it's been that way from day one. Remember I told you before, he wants to establish this early on, early tradition. And it's been for every generation, and it's forbidden for someone in Chutz Laaretz to observe one day. And if you're living in Eretz Yisrael, it's forbidden to observe one day. Excuse me, two days. You have to observe two days. And if you move from Eretz Yisrael to Chutzlar, one second. If you live in Eretz Yisrael, it's forbidden to do two days. You have to do one day. And if you move from Eretz Yisrael to one of the Medinas in Chutzlar, then you follow the local Medina. And then the last part that we're going to do is he says, This is fascinating. This is fascinating. What's he, he's, he's raising a question over here. How could it be that in Chutz Laaretz you need to observe a second day Yom Tif, specifically a second day of Rosh Hashanah? We have a principle. Everyone knows. Like a simon, everyone remembers. Everyone knows. Lo yadu Rosh. Rosh Hashanah is not allowed to be on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, or on a Friday. Well, if you're going to add a second day, then you're going to have your second day on one of those days. So he says, come on, that's a silly question. That rule is only about the first day. But you see that people were asking that question. So whether it was Karaites who were poking fun at Jews and saying, you have a rule, loya do rush, right? Oh, well, guess what? You're ended up having Rosh Hashanah on the second day. Or whether this was confusion within the Jewish community itself, I'm not sure. But he felt that it was important enough for him to raise the question and to give the answer. Fine. So if we stop here, 
what do we see? We see that you take him and you take the Rambam, there are similarities, but there are also differences. And I'm going to summarize that for you uh, in a moment. But what I want to do right now is to say, hold on a second. If you were just reading this closely, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah for this author in Eretz Yisrael is one day. It's pretty clear that way. First of all, he never says otherwise. Second of all, remember he brought a Pasuk from the Chemya that was talking about Rosh Hashanah and said, one day, it's one day. And then remember, he asked the question, and, and don't worry about the rule of Lo Yadu Rosh, don't worry about that rule, why? Because that's only about the first day. So in other words, <laughs> Rosh Hashanah is very much part of the conversation, and, and, and he only asks that question in Chutz Laris. If you're in Chutz Laris, you need to do two days. What about Lo Yadu Rosh? So that whole question, what about Lo Yadu Rosh, he only asked it if you're outside Eretz Yisrael. He didn't ask that when you're inside Eretz Yisrael. So it does seem from here that this particular author is suggesting that Rosh Hashanah is observed one day. What did Rambam tell us? Rambam said, what do you mean? Takaras Chachamim, Rosh Hashanah, two days, even in Eretz Yisrael. End of story. Well, he's saying something very, uh, something very different. So the emesis, and when you look around in the Rishonim, you see it's, nishke, it's not a Pashta Maisa. It's not a Pashta Maisa. So let's go back to that rush. Remember I told you the rush quoted the tshuva from Rav Hai Goin? Let's go back to that rush. Why does, he, why does he quote the tshuva? How does it land, the tshuva of Rav Hai Goin? How does it land there? It lands there because the Rosh HaMasech is Be'ah, Perak, Aleph, Simen, Dalid, quotes the Rif, where the Rif says like the Rambam, if you're in Eretz Yisrael, you need to do two days of Rosh Hashanah. However, the Rif had a Talmud, and the Talmud of the Rif, whose name was Rabbeinu Afrayim, and he disagreed, and he said, when do you need to do two days in Eretz Yisrael? That's only a symptom of when you're Mekadosh al when you're Mekadosh al and you live far, and you don't know, so then we have no choice, you do two days. But now that we follow the calendar, then we're going to treat Eretz Yisrael like it's all within the base Havad within the Sanhedrin, where basically you know exactly what the day is, and so Rabbi Ephraim, the student of the Rif, said, Rosh Hashanah one day, and he wasn't the only one. The Rush now brings from the Balamor, the Balamor is Rabbi Zerachi Alevi, he lived in the 1100s in Provence, and he wrote the Sefer on the Rif, where he dissents on numerous occasions with what the Rif says, and he also writes the same thing, he agrees with Rabbi Ephraim that in Eretz Yisrael, one day Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi the Balamor went further, and said that this was the tradition in Eretz Yisrael. All the generations, Rosh Hashanah was only observed one day. It's a new thing that came when rabbis from Provence went to Eretz Yisrael, and obviously they were used to doing two days Rosh Hashanah in Provence, and uh, what they did for the other Yom Tevim, I don't know, but they started observing two days Rosh Hashanah in Eretz Yisrael because they wanted to follow the Rif, because the Rif Taka held that way. And then the, uh, the Balamor brings another proof and that's our tshuva. Because in this tshuva that Rav Hai going wrote to Rav Nissen, if you remember, correct, remember Rav Nissen going wrote questions, one of the questions that Rav Nissen going wrote was the following. Why do you, Rav Hai going, you wrote elsewhere that in Eretz Yisrael they observed two days? Says Rav Nissen going, it's not true. We observe, we know, Rav Nissen is writing in his day that they were only observing one day of Rosh Hashanah. And what's Rav Hai's answer to that? Rav Hai, when he answers, says, when I said it, I meant, yeah, because I hold, like, not that he's quoting the riff, but he's like, I hold, similar to the sheet of the riff, that that's what they should be doing. I'm not necessarily saying that is what they're doing. Well, what do you see? That's why the Rush quoted this tshuva, because the same tshuva where Rav Nissen asked for clarification about the whole calendar issue is where Rav Nissen happened to ask this question about what's going on in Eretz Yisrael. Why, Rav Hai, did you say they do two days? In reality, they're doing one day. And so you have a whole bunch of evidence over here. That, there was a machloikas about this. The Rambam makes it very, very clear. Rosh Hashanah, two days, end of story. Turns out it was actually a machloikas of Hashanah. I mentioned before, it's not clear in Shas. It's not clear in the Gemara. When it comes to Chutzlar, it's clear. You have a Bavli and you have a Rishami. They asked the question of Chutzlar. They said the reason no longer exists anymore. Because we have a calendar. Could we just do one day? They said, you got to continue doing it. Okay, fine. So that's clear in the Gemara. But it's not clear in the Gemara, Eretz Yisrael and Rosh Hashanah. So we see it ends up being a machloikas. The Rif and the Rambam go in, and Rav Hai go in, go in one direction. But there are some other names that went in another direction. So now come back to our anonymous Chuba from the Cairo Gniza, and it's not so off the wall. When you hear him talking about Rosh Hashanah, and he's talking about it only as one day, including in Eretz Yisrael, we actually see there's some sources for this. This is actually a very complicated subject. What actually was going on in Eretz Yisrael? From the time, from the 4th century, when they stopped Kiddush HaKadosh up until Rambam's day, 
What was going on during that period? Was there two minhagim about Eretz Yisrael? Was there controversial? We don't, I, I don't think anything definitive has been said about that, but it does seem that there were multiple voices uh, on that particular uh, subject. Okay, so now let's sum up, because we've seen multiple voices. We saw the anonymous tshuva and the Cairo Gnizah. We saw Rav Sadia going. We saw the Rambam. So let's kind of sum up what, what did we see uh, during this discussion. First, let's focus on the things that everyone agrees upon. Everyone agrees in the sources that we saw today. I'm not talking about all other sources beyond today. The sources we saw today, everyone agrees. The calendar... The calendar that we follow today is Allah Lama Yishim Sinai. Rav Sadia Gain was on board with that. The Rambam was on board with that. Our anonymous author of his tshuva also is on board with this idea. Soito Ibor is Allah Lama Yishim Sinai. Number one. Number two. Everyone agrees. There's no controversy over the fact that in Chutz Laaretz we need to do two days of Yom Tif. That also is not controversial. Where is there some nuance or disagreement? When did the second day of Yom Tif start? That was a big difference. Because Rav Sadia Goyen will tell you, what do you mean, when? That started when Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain. He said, by the way, if you're not living in Eretz Yisrael, you need to observe two days. That's when it started. Our anonymous author in the tshuva, when did the second day start? It started with Galus Yechonyo, when they wanted to make a zecher, a zikar, and a tmura for what was going on, what they were missing. That's when it started. If you ask the Rambam, when did it start that they were doing uh, a second day, the, where you ended up having a problem that there were places outside Eretz Yisrael and they didn't know what the right kvias was. And he only talks about that in the context of Chachmei Mishnah and onward. Okay. Why? Why the second day? Here also there's nuance. Here also there's nuance and difference. Uh, if you ask the Reb Sadia Goyen why, you'd say, don't ask that question. It's a mitzvah that came straight from God. End of story. If you ask the Gniza author, he would tell you the why, the Zecher and the Zikar, and the, it's a very different uh, reason. The Rambam, as it was fake of the Yomah. So that's where you end up getting the difference. But the idea that in Chutz you need to be doing two days of Yom Tif, not controversial. The idea that the calendar itself, the underlying rules of the calendar, Allah Lama Yishim Sinai, not controversial uh, here as uh, well. So why then were there these differences um, of the why, of the when, and the why? Uh, I think this comes back to one, at least one possibility is the crime. The fact that we have this challenge of people uh, who have shared so much, so many beliefs, but then at the same time are rejecting Torah Shabbat Peh and they're vociferous about it and they're speaking about it and they're debating about it. That could lead to these types of um, uh, things of, of not, not changing the halacha, the halacha is not going to change, but changing the how we understand what happened in the past, I think, could very much change when you're in arguments. Or the reasons for why we do certain things also could p possibly change when you're in argument. I'm not saying that definitively, I'm throwing that out there as a possibility uh, for how to understand this. And of course, there was one more machlokas, and that is the machlokas of in Eretz Yisrael, Rosh Hashanah, what needs to be done, that actually was a major machlokas of the Rishonim. And now I'd like to conclude this subject by sharing a vart from the Tzamech Tzedek, whose birthday is coming up, uh, about Yom Tov Sheini Shogolis. There's a very geshmaka piece from the Tzamech Tzedek in Derech Mitzvah Secha, and uh, it'll take us two, three minutes, and then we're going to conclude. Zok the Tzamech Tzedek. The concept of Yom Tov Sheini Shogolis, I'm going to explain this based on what it says in the Sefer Or Nerav to Moshe Kordavero. Moshe Kordavero is the Ramak. He lived in Eretz Yisrael. He passed away in the 1570s. A major Mekubal. He writes the Sefer Or Nerav and he writes that Chutz Laaretz, because it's a physical coarse place, it cannot therefore receive the, the, the light on one day, just like Eretz Yisrael does, and so therefore it needs to be divided into two. This is what the Ramak says. So the Tzamaq Tzedek says, I'm going to explain what he means. What he means is as follows. How do we understand what a Yom Tif is? So the Pshut Shal Mikra understanding of a Yom Tif is that we behave differently today in order to remember an event that happened hundreds or thousands of years ago. Is there anything objectively different about today? No, there's nothing objectively different. What's different is that we're doing something different. That's it. And why are we doing something different? Because I want to remember Briyas Oilam. I want to remember Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. That's Pshut Shomikra. Comes Kabbalah and Chassidus and says, no, 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 no. If you want to know what a Yom Tif is or a special time, special time means that right now there's an objective difference in the world before you. The relationship between Hashem and the world is different in this moment. The Hamshacha from Hashem into this world is unique in this moment. And that's what makes a day a special day. 
כל יום, כל יום טוב, יש המשך אשר יש גל קדושה על יום אמו מיילא מהזמן, אין את הזמן, this is going to be important in a minute, and it's, it's a lofty level that it way transcends time, but it's coming into our world, into our space, where we're under the shackles of time, within the framework of time. And therefore, that's why we observe the Yom Tif. We observe the Yom Tif because there's actually Kedusha in the world. It's a very different way of thinking at it compared to the Pshut HaShomikra. So now he says, in Eretz Yisrael, which is a land that God seeks, and it's close to Elikuz, and it's Mezucheches B'Maylo Madrega, it is a, a, um, a fine, it's a lofty level, a fine level, then it could receive in one day that ray of light from the Abishter. But in Chutz Laaretz, that light can, doesn't settle in in one day because we're distant from Elikus, and therefore we make two days of Yom Tifs, because in two days we're able to get what Eretz Yisrael gets in one day. I Shabbos. So he goes, oh, one second, what about Shabbos? So here is where the Zman point comes up, Samach Tzedek says. Shabbos is Lamai Lamei Azman, it's a Ketusha Lamai Lamei Azman, but that doesn't come down and translate into the world of time. It doesn't come into the realm of time. In fact, that's why we use this language of Aliyah Sa'olimus. The kind of the world leads itself to go to that, you know, lofty space. Okay, so th that's not difficult. Because th the difficulty in Yom Tif is that the Ketusha we want to experience within time. Oh, you want to experience within time? Hold on. That's within your contours, within your limitations. Eretz Yisrael can do it quicker than, uh, than uh, uh, Chutz Laaretz. So another way of saying this is when a teacher wants to teach a, a student and where the student fully understands it and the concept becomes integrated with the student. So then one student needs to give five minutes, another student is going to take ten minutes. If, however, the idea is the teacher is just going to say something that's shock, shock and awe, then he can say the same thing. It's anyway higher than the kid's kalim. So he just says it shock and then everyone experiences the same. That's how he explains here uh, this concept. And he concludes by quoting a Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi talking about the fact that a Yom Tov Sheni Shal Goliath uh, is observed, that we observe a second day. The Lashem the Rishami is, Svura Yisi, I thought that I'm going to receive schar for two days of Yom Tif, but the reality is, you're only getting schar for one. The Pasha of the Rishami is, that a Jew living in, in Chutz Laaretz can say, <laughs> I'm living outside Eretz Yisrael, right? Extra mitzvahs for me, because I observe Pesach not once, twice. I do seders, not once. I do a starim, I do not once, I do it twice. More schar for me. Great opportunity. So the Yerushalmi is a little worried about that, especially the Shalmi's in Eretz Yisrael. Like, no, you Jews in Chos Laaretz, don't you think you get extra schar? Doesn't work that way. No extra schar. Okay? So, kind of like a mean Gemara. All right? Well, the Tzamech Tzedek says, no, you're misunderstanding the Gemara. What's schar here? Schar is the end of the Yom Tif. So you would think, why am I observing two days of Yom Tif? I'm observing two days. It must be that this extra art. So in Eretz Yisrael, there's less air, and in Chutz Laaretz, there's more, which is why I have a second day. That's what is wrong. No, 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 no. It's not that you have extra or you're getting extra schar. No, it's the same or. It just takes you an extra day to process that type of or. This is how Chassidus explained this, uh, this particular topic. All right. Uh, Look forward to greeting you next year, same time and place.